My close relationship with Dr. Patel goes back many years to the University of Texas at Austin, where he was my professor, to the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was a research assistant, and over the decades in our many reunions in Europe, but mostly in Chicago, which I think was his second home after Dallas. In 1979, Rick became department head of European painting at the Art Institute of Chicago, and about six years later, I was hired to work on the exhibition A Day in the Country, Impressionism in the French Landscape, which was based really on the classes that I attended at UT, which I should say were standing room only, and we had to hire a note taker because he was such a Jiminy Cricket kind of bouncing around that it was impossible to look at him to listen and take notes at the same time. Once I was a member of the Art Institute family, I was thrilled to be involved with Rick's 1988 exhibition, The Art of Paul Gauguin. For the first time ever, Gauguin was presented not only as a painter who exhibited with the Impressionists who left his wife and children and to go to Brittany and finally ended up in Tahiti, but as a remarkable maker of objects, as a, a variety of media, one of the most innovative potters, sculptures, and printmakers of the 19th century. Together with his co-curator, Charles Stuckey, who at that time was at the National Gallery, Rick traveled to Tahiti and to the Marquesas to look closely at the shorelines, the trees, the flowers, the beautiful golden-skinned citizens wearing colorful pareos, as well as the dogs, the pigs, from which, as Gauguin had done decades earlier, he to make his documents of the people, Rick drew his inspiration to reinvigorate the artist's story and to also make the amazing installations that you see here. After the exhibition's success in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., and in Paris at the Grand Palais, Rick became a committed Gauguinista. In many ways, Gauguin was a closer fit to his own outgoing personality and his extreme curiosity, even more so than his main man, Camille Pissarro, with whom he had done his dissertation and a book. Like Gauguin, Rick had overlapping professional lives and he somehow managed to be successful in all of them as an academic, as a curator, as a museum director, as an art critic, journalist, entrepreneur, and above all, a people magnet, always on the lookout for the next exciting project and challenge. Like Gauguin, he was a fearless world traveler whose worst nightmare was to be caught in a situation or a conversation that he considered boring. The 1988 exhibition was a game changer to Gauguin's studies. It enlarged our understanding of the artist's achievement, and it gave Rick the credentials to take on his next major role as the author for the catalogue resume of Gauguin being undertaken by the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, for which he worked many years. But Rick could never resist the next challenge. Long before it was trendy to do so, he embraced technical art history the scientific examination of works of art to be used as tools to enrich what we know, and many times leading to new discoveries that challenged and changed our interpretation. Working closely with scientists, conservators, curators, and other art historians, he quickly absorbed the results of these examinations. And he could see how the canvas weaves, the underdrawings, the pigments, the signatures could be put to the service of identifying and dating Gauguin's paintings. And this was no small accomplishment, for until recently, dating Gauguin's paintings, especially those from his years in Tahiti, have been a kind of a guessing game since the artist traced and copied, reused his canvases and really copied full some of his composition. And this was certainly the case with the wonderful painting that has been in the Dallas Museum of Art since 1963 under the pandemic one of many canvases that Gauguin made of daily life during his first trip to Tahiti in 1891. And the painting is even more compelling now that the darkened varnish has been removed, which you can see in this mid-treatment image. The work was rolled and brought back from Tahiti and exhibited in Paris in 1893 and again in 1895 as with the Tahitian title, Irari Oviri in French, Sous la Pandemus. In Paris, it would have been hung on the bright yellow walls of Gauguin's studio and gallery, where he it directly inspired, as we now know, another painting with the same title in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the MIA. 
Around 2012-2013, the DMA and MIA began research for a project which would delve further into Gauguin's pairs. And in October 2014, a group of conservators, curators, and art historians met at the Midwest Art Conservation Center located in the MIA for a scholar's day, focusing on his pairing, especially this one. And here you see Rick conferring with former conservator at the MIA, David Marquis. Behind them, both paintings, Dallas on the left and the slightly larger Minneapolis are shown unframed side by side for a purely visual analysis that was informed by the full scientific inquiry of the materials that had done prior to this. Common to both paintings are the specific yet unusual medley of branches, roots, and vegetation in the foreground. Pandamus trees with their thick entwined roots can thrive in a sandy soil than like those found in marshes or along the shoreline, as you can see in this painting. And anyone who has studied Gauguin knows that he is absolutely rigorous in keeping the approach to art as topographically specific, but not photographically precise, with the overall idea that it would be about the harmony and the decorative quality of the whole. From the day and a half study day in Minneapolis, it became clearer in what ways the Dallas picture had to have been painted before the slightly larger Minneapolis version. In the larger canvas, we see that the lines of branches and foreground are more simplified, more flowing, with their colors more carefully considered as would be expected for the second go round when the artist is less tentative and he knows more confidently in which direction he's going. In the Dallas Cognate, by contrast, the brushwork of the leaves hanging down between the two heads is more exploratory with a number that have been painted out or shortened, while in the Minneapolis version, the strokes are concise, more predetermined. Likewise, in the earlier Dallas canvas, there seems to have been changes made to the shape of the dog's head, where a rough reserve has been left after the dog was filled in. And it's kind of hard to see on the left, but you, there's a halo around the dog's muzzle. The Dallas composition is what we refer to then as the prime version of the matrix completed during the first trip to Tahiti in 1891, when Gauguin was making these documents, these sketches that would eventually make their way into his paintings. Gauguin seems to have been particularly fond of the pole carrying figure and his companion, and, th and this reappears in a number of works in different media. As I mentioned, it is likely that the Minneapolis painting, which I show you here, was conceived in Paris between 1893 and 1895 when he had the paintings from the first trip on his walls and he was rethinking and reconceiving them. Uh, during this period, he was also hard at work on a semi-autobiographical account of his first sojourn in Tahiti known as Noah Noah. And he chose to incorporate these same two central figures into the frontispiece of the illustrated version, which was never completed, but the wood block was used again and again, and it provided the basis for many experimentations, such as the four that are in the Art Institute's collection I show you here. Additionally, he recycled the same two figures in a watercolor or monotype print, which he made before leaving to go back to Tahiti. From the technical study day in Minneapolis, we were able to build on what we had learned when we looked at another Gauguin painting, this time in our collection at the Art Institute of Chicago, Te Briarao, or the uh, Big Tree, which was close in date to the Dallas paintings. You can see also that they have in common those decorative uh, foliage in the foreground. And we know that ours was painted on a canvas similar to that of the Dallas painting. This examination was the beginning of a larger project that we undertook at this time to study our nine Gauguin paintings at the Art Institute and our hundreds of works on paper in an online scholarly, interactive, and completely free catalog. And for this, we asked Rick to be the prime author. And we had to lure him back to Chicago, but I have to say he did this without much resistance. And he became part of the study team. And here you so see that. Oh, that's Minneapolis. right. Yeah. And we were, you know, I, my sixth sense was that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And then it arrived and we all decided it wasn't wrong. Because you know it's right there. Right. Yeah. And he yeah. does this in the, almost every medium. He does it in ceramic, he does it in wood, yeah. he does <laughs> it in printmaking. Yeah. He does, I mean, it's every, the chi is everywhere. And as you can see, and we were there in December, just a couple of months after the Minneapolis session, 
And as you see, Rick is in his element. He's teaching, he's asking questions, and above all, he's having fun. The research that we conducted over a year and a half was a groundbreaking, led to the groundbreaking exhibition that we organized with the Musée d'Orsay, Gauguin, Artist as Alchemist. And it was really a project that completed the circle that Rick had begun decades earlier with his 1988 retrospective in the sense that it again presented Gauguin, not just as a painter, but a risk taking maker of objects. But now we could enrich the story by the knowledge that we had acquired through these in-depth technical studies that have fed into so many discoveries, including that aha moment that confirmed the chronological precedence of the Dallas painting over the Minneapolis version. As I mentioned earlier, and as anyone who knows Rick well, uh, he's a people magnet and a kind of a yenta, kind of a matchmaker for putting together creative individuals from all walks of life. And I'll never forget when in the course of working on this exhibition uh, for 2017, Rick said I had to meet Richard Kelton a hugely intelligent and eccentric collector of all things Gauguin. And he said, no, you have to get yourself invited to his um, Marina Del Rey home. So I did, and it was the beginning of many visits. And not only did it lead to loans to the exhibition, but also to the acquisition of two of Gauguin's most important early sculptures, La Parisienne, and this weird, box carved with Duga dancers and a mummified figure inside that were part of the Kelton collection. So once again, this coup was made possible from Rick, always the rainmaker, always making things happen. I really cannot imagine a world without the unstoppable Rick. One of his last performances, and as anyone who has heard Dr. Patel uh, in a lecture, you know that they are performances in war was scheduled for April 2020 at the Art Institute, where he and I were gonna be in dialogue about his recently published book on modern beauty. Of course, that did not happen, but I'm sure that had we been able to be together on the stage, Monsieur Gauguin would have been, if not the prime focus, a great focus. And I'm even sure that I would have learned a lot and that as always with Rick, I would have had a fun time. Thank you.